Hello, everyone. Hello. Firstly, I'd like to thank you all for coming tonight on a rather kind of dreary and overcast day. So I greatly appreciate you taking your time out of your evening to come tonight. Um, one thing that I want to do first before we begin at all is I understand that there's quite a few Silver family uh, relatives and descendants that are in the crowd today. I'm just wondering if you wouldn't mind raising your hand. If you are one, I'd like to just see how many people we have got here. Oh, cousins. <laughs> yeah, cousins, relatives, descendants. Yeah, it looks like about half, it's about 20 some. So that's great. I understand it's a bit kind of like a family reunion for you all. So I'm very glad to give you the opportunity to come and learn a little bit about some of your ancestors and well, get the chance to gather again. To give you a little bit of information about our history talks, uh, we have these on the third Thursday of every month. Um, today's talk is obviously on the history of Myra, Illinois. Uh, next month will be uh, on Dottie Schroeder and her life here in Champaign. Oh, cool. And it will be conducted by one of our interns, Anna C. Lapp, who has been doing research over the summer. Um, normally, at this time, I would be introducing our speaker. However, today I will just be introducing myself. I won't make y'all clap for me at all, but I will at the very least tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I'm not actually originally from the Champaign area. I'm actually a relatively new addition to the area. I originally come from a town about two and a half hours to the west of here, and it's small and rural. It's called Monmouth, Illinois. Uh, it's home of my alma mater, Monmouth College, where I graduated with a bachelor's in communications and history, and I got my master's degree in museum studies from Western Illinois University in 2021. Then my wife got married in 2022, and we moved here shortly after in May of that year. And we've been here ever since. I started volunteering at the Champaign County History Museum in January of this year and officially joined the organization as the museum manager just this August, only two months ago. So during that time of my volunteer, I really got the chance to dive deep into the history of our local community and engross myself with some of the fascinating stories that I've come across through the community's rich history. <coughs> I came across this story um, in a collection of local legends and tall tales where I came across, you're more than welcome, the story of a woman who was taken by a train in 1903, and I wasn't exactly sure how much truth there was to this story, and so I started looking into it, and well, I found myself in a rabbit hole. And so, before I begin, there are a couple of things that I need to make. This talk would not have been possible without the generous help of many local community members who provided me with phone numbers, names, um, photos, and information in regards to the history of the Silver family and Myra, and Mike Pinnell, Charlene Wirtz, the Swearingen family, Ann and Julie Swearingen, mm -hmm. Travis Lotion, Neil Silver, and Jim Craper have been invaluable in this research. And without their assistance, this talk most likely would not have been possible, or at the very least, there certainly wouldn't have been as many pictures as there are. So, <clears throat> as we begin, the first thing that I want to make sure we cover are a couple common misconceptions that I came across during my research that I'm sure some of you are aware of. The first one is the actual spelling of Myra itself. If you look up Myra Silver's name, it's spelled with a Y. But if you look it up on Google Maps and look up Myra, Illinois, it's spelled with an I. Why? Because the Illinois state apparently can't get their names right. When they first made the town, they spelled it with an I, and then when the railroad came into town later in 1881, well, they just went off the state and they called it Myra with an I as well. The only difficulty that I came across, though, was in all of the correspondence letters between the family and Myra, or any time I found any legal documentation, with Myra Silver's name on it, it was always spelled with a Y, except for possibly one of the most important pieces of paperwork. Her father, David Silver's will, has her name spelled with an I. Mm. Why? I am unsure. In all of the other legal documents that Myra has her name on, and even with her signature, she has always spelled her name with a Y. So why her father would spell her name with an I, I do not know. The other common misconception, or at least confusing point, is, is that there were actually two Myra Silvers that were living in Champaign County uh, between the 1870s and the early 1900s. The Myra Silver of this talk is the daughter of David Silver. The other Myra Silver was actually the daughter of one of Myra's, uh, was, was the daughter of one of Myra's brothers. And she eventually married into the Love family, but she passed in 1899 due to illness. 
The Myra silver of this story did not pass until 1903. But if you ever come across two Myras, that is why. And they're both spelled the same name with a Y. So, to begin, we'll first talk about the first silver that's relevant to the story in Champaign County, David Silver. He was born in New Jersey in 1978 to his parents, um, Joseph and Patience Silver, and he was the fourth son of eight siblings. Shortly after David was born, his family would move to Pennsylvania in 1800. I was unable to locate the exact space that they decided to settle, but they did not stay there long, as they would continue their trek out west, and they would eventually settle into Warren County, Ohio, first stopping in the Ridgeville area, and then eventually finding a permanent settlement in Springboro, Ohio. During his time in Ohio, he would marry shortly thereafter. Uh, just before he turned 25, he would marry Eliza Munger, um, who lived in Montgomery County, just to the northwest of Warren County, and shortly thereafter, they would proceed to have five children. The first child, I do have dates here, because there are a lot of dates and names in this talk, so if you will apologize, I've got quite a lot here. So, the first child was William, who was born in 1824. John was the second son in 1826. Then, that's the original farmland. Looks like I went a little bit too far. Here, there we go. So, um, yeah, uh, after John, it was Wallace in 1829. Myra Silver was born in 1834. And the last to be born to the family was Perry in 1840. The family would grow and they would become known for his dairy farming. Specifically, so much so that he would make weekly trips down to Cincinnati, which was a 40 mile trek one way every single week to sell his dairy and dairy products to accumulate and grow his wealth. Um, shortly thereafter, while they were still living in Ohio, um, the second son, John, would purchase a sect of land on the southern side of the David Silver Farm and have as his own sect of farmland. Um, Aside from his weekly trips to Cincinnati, David would also take business trips around the Midwest, and it was on one of these trips, uh, I'm unsure of the date, I've come across a couple of specific ones. Um, the one that I found the most concrete information of is that it was 1839 when David traveled to Eastern Illinois and discovered the prairie that was located around the area of Urbana. Um, and he found that he loved the prairie so much and he loved the wide open spaces that he decided that he wanted to move there and move his family there. So, in 1854, David Silver would move his family in March. He would move out first and start a settlement and start building his home, and then his family would move out later in December. Um, the home resides off of what is High Cross Road or Route 130, uh, just to the south of the intersection at Windsor Road. Um, the home was first built in 1854 and was a replica, or at the very least, a similar replica to the family home that was built uh, in Ohio. While I am unsure if the claim is true, in David Silver's obituary, the brick home that his family built here in Illinois is recorded as being one of the first brick residencies that was built in the county. Um, otherwise, <clears throat> later, they would continue to farm their land and uh, the family would basically farm the land together until their sons would start to grow up and start to marry and start having families of their own. And sometime before 1863, David would buy a large sect of land that was roughly 320 acres just to the north of Philo that I assume his sons would manage. Later on, uh, John Silver would buy land in partnership with one of the W brothers. I'm not exactly sure if it was William or Wallace, but they would own and farm that land together. Um, that was Wallace. It was Wallace? Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate that. I assumed it was Wallace later in some later plat maps. Wallace Silver's name will come across there as well. So it was my assumption, but not entirely sure. <laughs> um, as far as the families go that would start to grow up, Perry, William, and Wallace would all start their own families and would settle in the Philo area, um, while Myra and John, who were unwed, would stay with their father and mother in their family home um, in uh, just to the south of Myra in their old brick building. Um, and Eliza would unfortunately pass 
1863. Um, as far as what happened afterwards, um, David's health uh, also waned in the later years of the 1860s, and he decided that he would prefer to spend his last remaining years at the farm that he grew up in and still owned in Springboro, Ohio. He would move back with his son and daughter who were unwed, John and Myra would join him. And I'm unsure of the exact date, but John would return to Champaign County first and would manage the farmland and live in the family home. That is a picture of John on the left uh, with the original farm and home behind him. Uh, David would pass in 1875 uh, due to health issues and Meyer would then return shortly thereafter as the owner of all of the David Silver farmland. One thing that was a bit of an oddity to me, or at the very least was interesting, is while it was not illegal for a woman to own land in the late 1800s, it was still fairly uncommon, especially of land of such vastness. David Silver owned roughly 600 acres in the Champaign area, and giving that much land, to his only unwed daughter who had no wit, uh, living heirs seemed to be a bit of a mystery. The only things that I'm able to theorize is that it was either a matter of convenience or a matter of rent. The other family members, Wallace, Perry, and William, who were living in the area and had not returned to Ohio and had families and had living heirs, had already settled and were living in their family homes. And it was a matter of convenience to not uproot them to move them and force them to go to a different farmstead. And since Myra and John had lived in that home previously, that they would oversee the family farm. It also might have been a matter of right. While John did move back to Ohio and assist his father in his final years, he moved back before his death. And that left Myra as his sole and only caretaker. And there was a bit of a disconnect between the other brothers and their father. And as Myra took care of David in her final years, it's most likely that it was seen as her right as the final living heir that was assisting him in his final moments that she should have the right to own the farmland. The true reason though I have not been really able to find. Otherwise, um, some other important notes about the siblings. Um, I was able to find record of uh, a Civil War um, papers. Perry did serve in the 76th Infantry um, he would serve um, and unfortunately develop a chronic illness during his service that would unfortunately lead to his death in 1885, and he was the first of the original siblings to pass. But before we continue on with the Silvers and get too far ahead of ourselves, let's talk a little bit about one of the more influential players in this story, the railroad. The railroad first came into town with the Illinois Central or train north-south through Champaign. Well, looking to capitalize on a new route that would serve as the east-west route, the Great Western first came into the area in 1874 with a main line that ran through the communities of Sydney, Philo, and Tolono. Later on, in 1874, the Great Western was purchased uh, by the Wabash Railroad, and they would then use that as their main line, which would allow them to travel not just from their main line from Toledo, Ohio, but all the way out west towards St. Louis. Later on in 1881, in a way to uh, help the communities of Urbana and to help the community of Champaign and to possibly compete with the Illinois Central, the Wabash Railroad started making plans to build a line from Champaign through Urbana, down south through Sydney, and then all the way down south to Paris, Illinois, and then potentially even down to Cairo. However, they got about 30 miles into that route, started in Champaign, got down to Sydney, and ran out of money. My best guess is that the reason why they were having so much financial troubles is that the Wabash Railroad at that time in the early 1800s, 1880s specifically, was owned by Jay Gold, who was a very infamous rail baron, uh, robber baron uh, during that time and was well known for his less scrupulous business practices per se. <laughs> in fact, the Wabash Railroad only a couple of years after the line was finished would go on a nationwide strike uh, in protest of their working conditions and wages, as well as uh, it would include other uh, of Gold's railroads, including the Union Pacific. Um, but on this short route, there were two stops that were made along the way. Deers, Illinois, and more importantly to the story, Myra. Why those two stops were added was more of a matter of common practice more than anything else. When railroads were building these smaller secondary lines, they would build stops about every 
two or three miles to service local farmers and well to have grain elevators built which the railroad would then have property rights to and also to keep their own money rolling through uh, what would be more important to this story passenger rail travel to service the Urbana area. But before we go forward, let's take a look at what the silver farmland looked like right after the railroad was put into place in 1893. Most importantly, you can find Myra Station right there in the center at the corners of what is now 130 and Windsor Road. Just to the south of that, you've got Thomas Finnegan Farmland, and just to the south of that, you've got Myra Silver's Farm, which is about 240 acres that her father left her. And that little black dot right there is the family residence. Like I said, it still stands today. It is still in that spot, uh, in that spot, and the Swearingen family currently owns that okay. land. Okay, Swearingen, Swearingen. Yep. Right there, you've got J. L. and Myra Silver. That is John Lawrence Silver and Myra Silver. John was the only other unwed sibling of the uh, Silver family, and John acted as Myra's business partner to help manage the farm and help to grow the business. Otherwise, you will find all the way in the top left here, a Mary Silver. There were two Mary Silvers that were a part of the Silver family at the time. Um, if I remember right, it was um, Wallace's wife, um, Mary Kerr, but more likely what I believe that to be was Perry's wife, who was Mary Heisler. Um, since Perry passed away in 1885, at the time of this plat maps creation in 1893, Mary Eisler, or Mary Silver as it would have been, was still alive and had her children to look after, her child Alfred, and I imagine that this is most likely the farmland that they inhabited. Otherwise, in Phyla Township, you can see they owned quite a bit more farmland. Myra Silver is a little bit difficult to see, but it's vertical there. It's another 320 acres that Myra Silver owned there. Just to the right of it, another 160 acres that John owned. The MD Silver was a bit of a mystery to me. Um, there were a couple M's in the family. There were a couple Marys. There was a Martha Silver. I imagine, though, that most likely was still Myra Silver, though. I was not able to find Myra's middle initial, but I imagine that was still her land. Just to the left of it, you've got W Silver, which, as we learned, was Wallace. And then... Wally, right Wally. here, still owns part of that farm. Mm -hmm. Really? Right here, Wally still owns mm -hmm. part of that farm. It's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Family's still on the same land that they lived in in 1854. It's fascinating. Right here, there's 80 acres of land that is under the name David Silver. That's not land that was left over after David Silver's death. One of the brothers <coughs> had a son who was named David, and at the time he was starting his own family, and they bought 80 acres of land just off to the left, and were living there. The last bit of silver is all the way down here to the south of Philo, a JB silver. What I believe that is, is that is Joseph's silver. Joseph Silver was one of William's sons. He was unmarried at the time and would never marry, but he is the only other J that I have been able to find in the Silver family line. And it's not, obviously, John L. Silver because of the JV. It's one of the mysteries. It's Joseph. That... It's Joseph. It is Joseph? Glad my intuition was correct. <laughs> so, 10 years after this plat map created, was created, the family, though, would face their first tragedy. In the early morning hours of November 20th in 1903, Myra, who was assisting Jacob Holderman uh, at his office at the elevator in Myra Station, was leaving to catch the train to Champaign, and she was looking to cross the tracks. Whether she heard or disregarded or did not see the train oncoming is unknown, but she stepped out onto the tracks in front of a Wabash River passenger train and was struck and instantly killed. Her body was thrown about 25 feet, and the newspapers, unfortunately, at the time, did not leave details of her death out. Um, but there were multiple witnesses to her death, and it was quite a shock to the local community as she was both a wealthy businesswoman, but also a very influential member of her local community. And there were many of witnesses of her death from the people who were on the train, the conductors of the train, to those that were on the platform and tried to warn her. There was a fireman that had attempted to warn her before she stepped on the track and whether it was disregarded, the warnings were, or she just did not hear, is unknown. 
but she was age 69 when she died and left behind no direct heirs. She was buried in Mount Hope Cemetery, um, and the plans were that uh, her father, who was, born, who was buried at the uh, Springboro Hicks Site um, Cemetery, or what was also called the Friends Cemetery, it was a Quaker cemetery, uh, was to be moved and buried alongside Myra at the Silver Plot uh, at Mount Hope Cemetery, um, which also proved to be a bit of a mystery itself. I was able to find no record of her mother being moved or of her father being moved and buried in Mount Hope Cemetery. In fact, if you look up the Springboro Hicksite Quaker Cemetery, David Silver's name will pop up, but no headstone can be found. So whether that move is true or not, I'm unsure. It was reported multiple times in local newspapers and it was also recorded in Myra's will as one of the uh, provisions that she wanted done so that she could bury, bear, uh, be buried alongside her father but I haven't been able to find any record of that actual movie. Yeah, uh, he is buried in Springboro, and there is no marker. Mm -hmm. I was there a few years ago. They have a record of it at the, yeah. at the, at the cemetery office. The other mystery was Eliza's grave. She died here in Champaign County, and with Mount Hope being the oldest cemetery at the time, I imagine that she was buried there. However, I have found no record of Eliza's grave either. It's one of the other mysteries that I have been unable to locate. So, let's take a look at Myra's will. After her death, she had extensive records on what was to occur and what was to happen in the case of her death. She appointed two executors, R.S. Wilbur and her brother, John Silver, who was her business partner. Shortly thereafter, uh, Myra's death, um, Fred Silver also went ahead with the purchase of the grain elevator from Jacob Holderman for the amount of $6,000, and he would start up his own company, the Silver Elevator Company. Otherwise, the land was to be divided, her debts were to be paid off, and bits and pieces of her wealth were to be divvied about amongst the family members. There were many records of sums between $250, $500, $1,000, that were to be given to siblings, nephews, nieces, cousins, and other relatives. In fact, she even left $300 to her local church as well. But specifically, the important bit here is, is that these pieces of land and, the, and this monetary uh, financial wealth was to be given out after John Silver's death. All of this hinged on once John was passed away, that Myra Silver's will would become effective. So, after Myra's death, John Silver and Fred Silver would continue to work. John would continue to farm the land on what was now his land. He was very well known for his cattle. In fact, he was even reported in the local newspaper in 1905 and 1908 for the quality of his cattle and the amount that he would sell. In fact, Colvin's Enterprise was apparently a, na a nationwide kind of uh, cattle salesman, and he was so impressed by the quality of his steer that he wanted to talk about it in the local paper. Fred, though, would go on to own the elevator at Myra Station, and he would run the station until John's death in 1909 at the age of 83. Um, I wasn't able to find any pictures of Alfred Silver, but I do have a sketchwork of him and a depiction of what the elevator would have looked like. Um, that's a picture from around the 1920s, 1930s, but there were no major changes until the 1950s at the elevator. And this is where things kind of went off the rail, as you might say. What happened was, is after John died, as his executors were going through his will, they started to discover some inconsistencies in the land that John owned and what he did not own. John's will was not updated since 1898, before Myra's death. And in his will, he left everything that he owned to Myra. And in the chance of Myra's death at that time, well, it was to be divvied and sold uh, by a pre-approved council. Well. He didn't leave a council, and he didn't leave anyone to appoint a council, so exec his executors uh, kind of uh, filled in that position and started to go through John's estate and start to appraise how much uh, his wealth had accrued in the six years after Myra's death. What they found is, is that John, in 1903, had been concealing and been uncooperative with R.S. Wilbur 
to hide sects of land that Myra owned that he had claimed himself, as well as farm equipment, cattle, grain, and even the family silverware. <laughs> the total scale of John's deceit was around $15,000. I wasn't able to find an exact number on how much uh, money or land John hid from R.S. Wilbur, but essentially he uh, used his position as executor to hide this information so that it could not be included in Myra's estate. Why did he do it? It's difficult to know. My theory is, is that it's most likely that John did this specifically so that his brothers could not contest the land that John was working on. Since Myra and John technically were business partners, despite the fact that Myra owned the vast majority of the farmland, Myra owned about 460 acres, while John only owned about 225 acres, John wanted to make sure that, well, he got to work the land that he thought was his, as well as keep the steer and cattle that he had been raising that he also thought was his. But at the same time, there were a couple mysteries involved here. In Myra's will, the third thing that she specifically states is that all of her real estate was to be given to John Silver until the time of his death. I think that it's most likely the fact that that phrasing was a bit vague that John was able to situate himself into hiding this property. Since real estate is a bit vague, well, that's real estate that's farmland, it's real estate that they have residences on, it's anything that lies on those uh, real estates. It's a bit vague. But either way, what happened was is that Fred, uh, after the executors introduced these misdeeds to the family, decided to sue John posthumously. So they didn't dig up his corpse and take him into the courtroom. Uh, they started court proceedings so that they could go back into Myra's will and correctly estimate how much Myra's uh, estate and her holdings were before John started to manipulate those by basically fraudulently staking his claim to bits of land. The only piece that I was able to find that I could definitely prove that John did fraudulently is that there was a bank deposit box that was $5,600 that was at the Urbana First National Bank. That was all Myra's money. And John, after Myra's death, said that was his. Took those funds for himself to buy bits and pieces of land around the station. In addition, uh, during uh, his life from 1903 to 1909, John also denied a couple contracts that Myra had verbalized, agreed to, but had not finalized into writing. One of those was the purchase of about 80 acres that surrounded Myra Station, and the other was that she had agreed to help Fred buy the elevator. John denied both of those, backed out of them, most likely just so that he would not have to give out any more money that he thought was his. Otherwise, the court case also wasn't easy going either. What happened was, Fred and the other family sued. They brought R.S. Wilbur back into the courtroom as he was now the only sole living executor at the time to reevaluate Myra's will and also go through John's will and evaluate it as well. And so what happened was, well, he did so and then he gave his first estimate of what the family wealth would be. And the family went, no, that's not it. And so they complained to the court that R.S. Wilbur had left out bits and pieces of land, about $10,000 worth of land, which would be uh, about seven to $800,000 now. It's a lot of money. So, well, R.S. Wilbur gets to work on his second uh, estimate and then dies. So now there's no living executor for the will and they have to bring in a new guy. Thankfully, R.S. Wilbur had appointed a secondary executor in the case of anything were to happen to him, who was N.A. Riley. Um, N.A. Riley went through, finished the uh, estimate of the will, the family accepted that, and then they went ahead. Um, the family members received their money, the land was split up. The only part that was ever sold was the farmland just to the south of Myra Station, where the original family homestead was. That was sold at auction on the steps of the Urbana Courthouse, and Alfred Silver, who was Perry's son, would buy that uh, for $185 an acre. It was around 200 acres that he bought at that time. So the Silver family would look to move on. These plat maps are from 1913. Fred would live on the family residence and would control all about 300-some uh, acres 
of farmland, uh, but he would not have farming as his primary business. No, Fred had bigger aspirations for that. In 1909, Fred would throw his hat into the ring for assistant supervisor of Urbana. But this itself wasn't easy going either. It was even controversial to a point. All of the other cities in the county only had one assistant supervisor, and well, Fred, he wanted to become the first second assistant supervisor. And so there were talks of, well, even if Alfred Silver is justly and duly elected as Urbana's second assistant supervisor, they were going to seek to oust him from his seat. Well, he was duly elected. Those complaints fell on deaf ears. Urbana was undergoing a substantial growth spurt in the early 1900s, and it was deemed necessary for the city to continue to grow, that they would get more assistance in supervising and managing the city. And otherwise, the remaining original siblings, Wallace and William, would retire to their farms. However, their lives would not go without misfortune. Wallace would continue to live peacefully, it seems, until 1915 when he would pass, but William would not be so lucky. In 1910, William, who was helping one of his tenants, James Cook, uh, in the barn, uh, lowering some hay bales, uh, James was up top, William was down below, and James would lose his grip on a 108-pound bale and send it tumbling 15 feet down on top of poor William, and he would be crushed. He fractured a rib, his body was bruised, but he did not die. He would continue to live another seven years when fate really seemed to have it out for him. He was killed in a car accident with his son, Joseph, uh, near the town of Beemont in Pyatt County. Um, Joseph was injured, but not fatally so, but William uh, would pass away due to his injuries at the time. Otherwise, as far as the family's ownings go, uh, the A.E. Silvers, you see that there, Thomas Finnegan still owned the farmland in 1913. Otherwise, you can see that the land was split up a bit. You can see here Wallace Silver and Wallace Silver there. D.A. Silver, that's David Silver, one of the sons, now owns two plots of 80 acres of land. The A and S uh, Silver here and here, that was Anna B. and Sarah Silver, who were some of Wallace's children, and they were given that land to, um, from Myra. That was in Myra's will that they would receive sex of land both to the south of Myra Station and north of Philo. Otherwise, you can see there that Joseph, in 1913, still lived south of Philo. However, things would still, unfortunately, continue for the Silver family, and tragedy would once again strike. <clears throat> Fred, who would continue to work as the assistant supervisor for the city of Urbana, and was very well known for the quality of his work and the quality of his character, decided that he would continue to pursue his political endeavors and would pursue the supervisor position for the city of Urbana in 1923. He unfortunately did not win the primary race for the Republican seat, and he would seemingly retire to his farmland and take care and tend to his children. However, using his connections and as a part of his more free time, he would take his family on trips around the Midwest, and it was on one of these family vacations where he and his daughter Mary, who was also known as Ethel, uh, was, her middle, was her middle name, and she would go by Ethel. Um, we're traveling, and we're in the area of Montello, Wisconsin, on the Fox River, which is right here. It's right in between Oshkosh um, and the Wisconsin Dells. Um, what happened was, um, Ethel, who was 25 at the time, was swimming in the river, and she was caught up in an undertow, and she was dragged underneath the water, and her father, looking to save her, dove in after her in vain, and they would both unfortunately drown. Um, their bodies were both transported back to Champaign and they would be buried in Woodlawn Cemetery. Otherwise, the Silvers would still continue to live on. After their father's death, Harold Silver and his brother John would live in the farmstead in the original family plot. Though it was split up a bit more, this is Anna and Sarah Silver again, who also went by Sally, uh, Alf E. Silver is the one that's a bit confusing for me. Alfred E. does refer to the Alfred that drowned in 1926 as his middle name was Edmund, but I haven't been able to find another Alf E. Silver in the family tree. As to why that is in 1929, I have been unable to answer yet. 
Otherwise, in Phyla Township, you can see once again that the family split up a little bit more. There's not as many silvers, or at least as much silver farm land. David Silver now owned uh, the section of land that was John's and was Wallace's, as Wallace died in 1815 and would control more land. And you can still see her, JV's still going strong in 1929 and still living on the same 120 acres south of Philo. Important note, James M. Love here was the gentleman uh, that Myra Silver, the other Myra Silver that passed away in 1899, um, she was the family that they married into. It was a Mary Silver Love. She passed away in 1899. The Silvers didn't really have that much connection to the elevator after that, but the elevator and the family would still continue. And the elevator would seemingly not have that many issues until 1942, when a tornado roared through the area. It started in the eastern corner of Pyatt County, would come into Champaign County, and would first strike the community of Savoy, and would continue its northeasterly track, hitting Myra head on. Um, this storm spawned multiple tornadoes across the Midwest and killed as many as 120 people across six states. There were about 20 people killed in the Champaign County area. Six were killed um, in Mayview. Most, though, were killed in Alvin in Vermilion County as it was completely leveled. But what happened in Myra, thankfully to their elevated position, they could see the tornado coming. So, well, the five workers that were working that day saw it coming, went, nope. Four of them dove into the elevator pits, and one dove into the well at Myra. All five of them would live, but specifically one of the employees reported and had memories of a corn crib a quarter mile of away being picked up, being thrown over their heads over the elevator before the tornado struck the station itself. In addition, the elevator itself was also partially damaged. Sheet metal was torn off the side of the silos there, as well as a box car was thrown off the tracks and into a pile of lumber next to it which photos of the tornado damage here. The office building that was located at Myra Station was completely demolished, and a couple of the silos were basically just metal wrecks. And there you can see the box car that was thrown off the tracks into that pile of rubble. Eventually though, the Silvers would return eight years later to the elevator. Harold and John Silver, who were sons of Alfred Silver, uh, who were living on the family farm at the time, um, would go on and purchase the elevator in 1950. This is one area that I haven't had time to research too in-depthly. The court case involves a couple hundred some pages and about 50 or 60 news articles that I still need to parse through. But essentially what happened is, is they bought the elevator and started looking to expand the storage at the elevator building Quan sets and additional silos after the tornado had destroyed a couple and they started the Silver Bros Grain and Coal Company in 1950. However, they would quickly find themselves in a bit of hot water. Shortly after they bought the elevator, only a couple of years afterwards, it was found that there were a couple issues with the local government. What was going on was that the Harold and John Silver were selling grain that was owned by the government in part with private uh, grain and essentially selling grain that was not there. So the government came in, said, you can't do that, you owe us money, and they charged them with um, grain conversion, essentially. And in addition, there were some other issues that the government found where uh, Harold Silver specifically had been charging customers for grain that had become diseased. And while John was <coughs> not involved, he was initially charged, for the same crime as Harold. Uh, there were three counts against him on that. They were eventually dropped, though, as it seems that John was not aware of those specific charges. Eventually, the um, costs of the court case, as well as additional issues within the family, would cause Harold and John to sell the family farm in the elevator in 1953, and they would eventually declare bankruptcy in 1955. They would no longer be living on the family farm. It was actually bought by the Swearingen's at that time. Um, I talked to Ann Swearingen, I don't know if she's in the crowd today. And her grandparents were the one who bought the farm from Harold in 1953, and they've been living on the land ever since. The case, though, would still continue to kind of plague Harold and John until 1958, when it eventually ended. Uh, eventually, they, uh, the government agreed to their bankruptcy claims, and uh, the charges kind of went away afterwards. 
However, one thing that still remained was a sense of community. A lot of the local farmers that remember living in the area would always come to the elevator as it was the community hub. Um, I've talked to many local farmers and members of the family, and they would remember coming to the elevator to buy a cold a candy bar or a soda or come with their fathers when they were bringing their grain to the elevator and their fathers would be in the back playing cards or talking shop. But it was really the hub for the community and the elevator would still be there. The Quantsons were repaired. Uh, that's an aerial shot from 1969 of the elevator. You can see the main part of the elevator there and the Quonsets on the other side. Otherwise, unfortunately, Myra would have to end. The Wabash Railroad was eventually bought out by Norfolk and Western in 1964, and it would change its name in 1982 to the Norfolk Southern, and the line would be abandoned shortly after that name change. The line um, was essentially non-functional. The passenger rail travel had ended sometime in the 40s or 50s. I've been unable to find an exact date of when that passenger travel did end, but it was essentially just used for freight travel from the 1950s until the 1980s. But in 1986, the elevator was torn down. This was in part to help the city. The curve at Myra Station was a bit known as dangerous. There were numerous car accidents that occurred on that curve, and the city wanted to do something about it. In addition, Route 130 and Windsor Road were starting to become a bit more of major thoroughfares through the area on the eastern side of town, and while they wanted an intersection there, to allow traffic to flow better. And so the elevator was in the way, the line was abandoned, there was no reason to keep it up, and it was eventually torn down. The tracks remained in the area though for a little bit while longer, but they were also eventually torn up as well in the early 1990s. And now, unfortunately, a road sign is the only thing left that stands of the Myra elevator, and it's misspelled. Am I right? <laughs> I greatly thank you for all your time today, and I'm very happy that all of you came, and it's wonderful to see so many Silvers in the crowd today. And so I do have a fun activity. Mike Pinnell gave me photos of a family reunion that occurred in 1927 and 1940. And if you'd like, while we're answering questions, you're more than welcome to come up and see if you can identify any of your ancestors. <laughs> but thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? Yes, no. Go ahead. He was talking, my dad wants to know this. Mm -hmm. He told me about four times before I got my leg out of the car. <laughs> um, Myra had a sign that said Myra. Mm -hmm. When they tore down the elevator, they took the sign and they've never put it back up. Mm -hmm. Who do you get a hold of or? And I said, this isn't the place to ask, but I said I would ask. <laughs> to be honest, I'm not entirely sure where it would have gone. Um, it was <clears throat> taken away. It, I've seen the photo, Charlene's standing next to it, um, and it is the correct spelling of M-Y-R-A. Um, to be honest, I don't know where the sign would have gone, whether it was taken away by the city or if it was taken away by vandals just looking to take the sign or what. It's something that I haven't been able to locate yet. It was taken when they did the construction mm -hmm. and just was never returned. So yeah. could have been the road construction company yeah, then taking it down and placing away. the sign. Okay. Because um, yeah, at that time when the road was reconstructed and the intersection was made, they did mm -hmm. put up the new sign with the incorrect spelling. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? If not, if you want to see the well. Yeah, just one interesting thing. Uh -huh. <clears throat> Your helper, Philo Wang, mm -hmm. thought that was interesting. <laughs> yes. Yeah, thank I you. So she's, too. she's been a longtime volunteer at the museum since uh, about last fall, and she helps us with all sorts of projects. She helps us research, um, and she's <laughs> invaluable for the museum. Philo, uh, yeah. yeah, if you're ever at the museum on Saturday, you'll meet her. She handles our desk on Saturdays. Uh, my dad told me, probably th at least 30 years ago, maybe maybe 40, that he remembered the day when his brother Ralph got killed, 1908. Mm -hmm. He was riding on a bean drill, driven by my grandfather. Grandpa made a turn and bounced him off, and 
he hit his head on a rock, killed him instantly. And my dad told me, Dad's only three. He said, I can remember it. Wow. I heard about that story from the family. I wasn't able to find any news articles, unfortunately, about his death in the local paper. Yeah. Um, so but, yeah. I have it. Mm -hmm. I have picture. I have a news articles, and I got pictures of the route too. So. Okay. Yeah. Also, Dad told me that when his daughter jumped in the water up at Montella, got in trouble. My Dad told me he thought his dad committed suicide because he felt so bad about Ralph's death, and he couldn't swim. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, in the death notice for Alfred and Ethel, um, it stated that the undertow was the cause of Ethel's drowning, and Alfred jumped in after her in an attempt to save her, and she was unsuccessful. I was just going to ask, so I married one of the Urbana Silvers mm -hmm. 24 years ago, and over time I've gotten asked if I know Eric Silver. Are you Eric? <laughs> <laughs> well, hi, Eric. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so I thought I'd see if Eric was <laughs> funny. <laughs> but no, I don't know if my I don't know my husband if you even know each other and your cousins or something. What are you two? <laughs> <laughs> Have you heard of us? Like Tom, <laughs> Tom Silver, Neil Silver. You know Neil. Oh, everybody knows Neil. Yeah. But nobody knows Tom. <laughs> At the very least, for recent family that live in the Champaign area, I was able to find a record that William's children moved out of the area. Specifically, I was able to find one of his daughters moved down to Texas, and another moved out east. But both Perry's children, Alfred's children primarily, since Perry only had one son, and Wallace's children stayed in the Champaign County area. And I imagine that's where most of the Silvers currently originated from. Yeah. Uh, William Silver, uh, the two, two children, Joseph and Anna, mm -hmm. Uh, they stayed, and they both lived in Philo mm -hmm. until they died. Okay. Uh, this one that you went to Texas is another. that's named Sarah. Sarah Con Con Conkling. Yeah, she yeah. married into the Conkling family. <coughs> it's not <coughs> local history here, but going back farther in, Ameri in American history, there's, there's a book that's called The Joe First Thousand Settlers, and in what's now the United States, I'm paraphrasing, I don't remember the exact name of the book, but essentially it's the first thousand settlers in America. And Archibald Silver is listed as one of those first thousand European settlers to come here to America. Well, he came here from Scotland in, in 1682 and settled in what's now New Jersey. Um, so the Silver's been here for 350 years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, first settled in Salem County, New Jersey, lived there for quite a long time. It wasn't until Joseph and Patience moved out west that the family would begin to move. Mm -hmm. Now, I just learned from Travis that, uh, what was it? Archibald Silver yeah. that I was just talking about. Well, yeah, but further back, like oh. my seventh or eighth grandfather, great grandfather, mm -hmm. was the first Freemason in Illinois. <laughs> No, in, in the U.S. In the U.S. Yeah. That's even better, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Arch Archibald Silver married a woman by the name of Christian Skeen. And this Christian Skeen's father, John, was the first Freemason in North America. Anyway, he, I'm he a Freemason, on. and I'm a nice temper, too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Are there any other comments or questions? Yeah, go ahead. I'm interested within your research. Will mm -hmm. I be able to uh, access that somehow? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, aside from the talk today, which was recorded, we'll publish that online sometime within the next month. Um, this research is also going to be a publication on our museum blog. I'm hoping to post the first part of my research, which primarily involves. 
uh, Joseph and um, Patience Silver and David Silver's move to the Champaign County area through uh, Alfred's death in 1926. Um, I'm still conducting some research on some of Myra's more recent history from the 1930s to today. That's gonna be coming out later, I hope, sometime before the end of the year. But hopefully, my research, which will include citations, will be out sometime in the next week or two. Does anybody recognize anybody in this? Yeah. These photos? Yeah, there's no other questions. Second uh, row on the right is my grandfather, while well, dad, Frank. Which one? Second row on the right, which side? All the way. All the way to the right there. Yeah. Okay, the one over. Third row on the right would be my grandfather. That reminds me of the White hat. Oh, yeah. oh, this guy. We think that's Roy, yeah, Roy Douglas. The gentleman behind him is Howard Wirtz. That's Fred Wirtz. And Fred is on the left? Yeah. In the front. And Fred, which is, which is Howard's brother, they're my, our uncles. We're just trying to figure out who the other guy is. Sure, no, absolutely. Is there any other section of the uh, presentation that you'd like to go back to and see again? Where did you see those? Yeah, there is money on the table. Yeah. Yeah. Who did yes. You yes. 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 The last slide, the family reunion picture. Mm -hmm. uh, so from the, in the bottom right corner, the third bully over, right there, that's Wally right here. That's amazing. Then the first boy sitting next to him, the second one over, him, that's Eric's dad, or maybe his grandpa. Oh, wow. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you'd like to come and get a closer look, please feel free. You're more than welcome to come out. Um, otherwise, it's the end of the talk. I am very thankful for everyone for coming out tonight. We're thankful for you doing that.